Throughout history, metaphors seem to have played an important role in introducing new technologies. Whether it's Al Gore talking about the internet as an information superhighway, or people describing cars as iron horses, we often relate to a new technology by modelling it in terms of things with which we're already familiar. And this can either help or hinder our understanding, depending on how good those models are. It's my belief that for generative AI and large language models in particular, we're going to need really good ways of thinking about these, really good crutches or heuristics that help us get the most from them and prevent us from falling into error. And I guess this week uh, agrees. Uh, James Entrilligator is a, a professor of design. He leads the Human Factors Engineering School at Tufts University, although he actually studies and, and did a PhD in cognitive neuroscience at Harvard and, and later moved into neuroscience. So he's got quite a, a varied and interesting background. Um, and lately he's been thinking about this issue of how we think about uh, LLMs. And to preview a little bit of what we talk about, he, he has an intriguing model of, of large language models as, as sort of gliders, as things for which we can set a path through space, a, a space of topics, and they will, will go on a kind of flight plan uh, following our instructions. And I think this is in contrast to some other metaphors, for example, the kind of stochastic um, parrot metaphor and the, the fuzzy JPEG of the web metaphor that's due to uh, Ted Chang. Um, and I actually think that, that all these metaphors have some validity, but, but what I really like about James's glider model is that it helps us think about how we prompt in a way that, um, say, the stochastic parrot doesn't really, right? Uh, thinking of LLMs as a stochastic parrot would lead you to think that you get no value from them. They're just going to randomly repeat the uh, uh, things that you put in. So this is a pretty varied discussion. We we start talking about design in general and then gravitate towards uh, LLMs, which for both of us are just a, a source of continual fascination and diversion right now. And I think that's probably enough preamble, so uh, let's start the main amble. I'm James Robinson. You're listening to Multiverses. <laughs> Hi, James Intrilligator. Welcome to Multiverses. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me on the show. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. So you you have a really varied background, lots of disciplines going on, but you have gravitated towards human factors engineering, which is, I guess, a field within design. Um, can you perhaps kind of situate us and and give us your your take on what design is? Um, sure. Sure. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it's it's a it's a great question. Uh, so design, you know, there's a lot of different ways of thinking about design and designers design all kinds of stuff, right? Everything from uh, artistic fashion design, jewelry design, atmospheric design, space design, all these kind of different designs. And I guess the way I I like to think of it is that a uh, designer is just someone who looks for a way to navigate through constraints and identify opportunities to create something that they want to create in a, in a sense. It's a pretty abstract uh, way of thinking about it, but I, that's how I like to think of it. So with, if you're an artist and you're trying to do visual art, you might be doing design to put down colors and patterns and shapes to try to convey an emotional uh, purpose or emotional meaning, right? So that in that context, that's what they are trying to design. Within the world of human factors engineering, primarily we're trying to design products, systems, services, experiences that work. And work is, again, kind of a bit of a relative definition, but it might be, for instance, you're trying to design a better website and you want it to create the right experience for someone, or you're trying to design a new kind of business, a new uh, entrepreneurial enterprise or a new social enterprise. Uh, whatever it is you're trying to design, it's a matter, it, it, the challenge for the designer is to really identify any constraints. It's, it's much easier to do design uh, if you have more constraints. So the example that uh, I've talked about many times in the past is that if you're trying to design a mug for someone, uh, it really is much easier to design the perfect mug if you really know for whom you're designing that mug. If you're designing a mug for a four-year-old kid, it's, it's a very different endeavor than if you're designing a mug for a 50-year-old person to drink coffee from. So, yeah. So that's how I like to think of design. It's really just about kind of finding opportunities to navigate through this kind of constraint space to reach your desired goal. Yeah, it it, it strikes me we had um, a Christian Burke, Canadian poet, and 
one of the ways that poetry works, one of the forms of poetry is to to bring constraint in. And that's a kind of way of, again, mm. narrowing the field of, of possibilities. But I, I think one difference between poetry and the design we're talking about here is you can choose to use constraint in poetry or, or not. And Christian has this kind of take on different ways that poetry can be done. You can, um, you can be sort of more self-conscious um, or uh, kind of unself-conscious and you can be, um, you can also bring in constraint and not constraint, emotion, not constraint, and, lot of ocean um so there's kind of different dimensions to that but um with design i guess you you the constraints are always forced upon you because you have a kind of physical object which has got to meet some needs which are not necessarily a thing you know it's like there's a brief given to the designer saying we need something um that does this and there's a lot of stuff that's unspoken there as well like yeah we need a mug but we're not telling you you need to figure out exactly who it's for, right? All the things that are kind of hidden in our um, sort of ideas for this mug. Um, that's right. Yeah, th there's, there's. Uh, th that's why usually when you're doing the design work, uh, there's a design research phase where at the beginning you spend quite a bit of time trying to uncover, you know, exactly whom are we making this mug for? What are they like? And usually in the design process. Um, you bring in all kinds of different constraints, let's say. So uh, in the world of engineering, where I'm now a, I'm a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, and often in mechanical design, you're looking for physical constraints, you know, the right materials, the right functions, the right stiffness, hardness, etc. Or it's, it's kind of the origin of the thought about human factors would be what are the human physical constraints, right? So the mug has to be the right size to fit a human hand, or a chair has to be the right size for a human to sit on or for 99% of humans to sit on, let's say. Uh, and so those are physical constraints in, in the world of design that I spend more time in nowadays. It tends to be more around digital design or cognitive design. So if you're designing an app, it's it, there's very little kind of physicality in the constraint space. It's, you know, there's some, you don't want the button to be too far from the thumb if it's a, intended to be used on a smartphone, uh, but a, a much more about, a much more of the constraint space there is about the cognitive constraints. So you want the right information architecture, you want the right menu, you want it to look right. And it's also about what I like to think of as the emotional constraints. So for instance, you want the mug, let's say, or, or the digital app, whatever it is, to have the right branding to kind of create the right emotional experiences. So there's a whole uh, range of constraints, everything from the very physical, um, either human physical or literally physical, physical, mechanical things, all the way up to kind of brand, emotionality, system constraints, legal constraints. Nowadays, of course, sustainability is another one of the constraints you want to bring in. Um, so yeah, there's uh, tons of different constraints that can come into play. And I think that's what makes design really an art is that it's up to the artist or the poet in the example that you gave to decide how what constraints they want to care about, how much they want to care about them, when they want to care about them, right? So they may break uh, convention. I think of like E.E. E. Cummings and poets like that who, you know, they throw away a lot of the constraints around traditional um, kind of uh, semantic or syntactic, whichever way you think of it, uh, kind of constraints that come into play and they, they play in that space. And that, that's one of the elements that bring artist, artistry into the design process is that you get to decide which of the constraints you want to acknowledge and kind of play within and which ones you want to sort of bend. <laughs> mm, yeah. Yeah. Certainly there, there, there seem to be some objects which people love, even though they don't seem super practical. And I guess there, you know, it's maybe drawing on some of the emotional aspects. Um, and perhaps sometimes just making something awkward <laughs> can make it more lovable, I, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, would, would it be fair to say as well that that kind of transition from the kind of more physical constraints to then looking at the cognitive ones that you mentioned and then emotional, it, has that kind of has the emphasis on those factors changed over time? Have we previously really just considered, you know, more the the ergonomics, let's say, and then um, as we've invented digital interfaces, as you said, it's it's become less about the ergonomics, or we perhaps we've just figured out the problems there, and more about a new set of problems that that then require a new way of thinking about design, a new set of constraints to set to to take into consideration. 
Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I, I mean, part of it, I would say, is is uh, time evolution. But I think another part of it is that we go through these different phases. So when we entered the, well, let's say pre-industrial revolution, there was a lot more focus on kind of uh, handcrafted uh designs and customized mm -hmm. bespoke solutions, so to speak. And there was a lot of craftsmanship and artistry involved in designing products. And of course, with uh, one of the challenges or one of the, again, it's both, both a challenge and an opportunity around um, automation is that you have to kind of give up often with the, the specialized, custom, hand-finished uh, bits of a solution. So if you want mm -hmm. to mass produce pottery, for instance, uh, it's very difficult to have it be uh, artistic and bring in the emotional constraints because they're produced en masse. Uh, it's one of the nice trade-offs, uh, not nice trade-offs, but one of the required trade-offs of things like automation is that you often have to uh, give up on some of these uh, finer emotional customizations or personalizations. Now, of course, one of the nice things uh, nowadays is that we can do a lot of this kind of design to print and custom design, and you can go mm. online, design your own. Uh, one of the nice examples from the early days of the internet was uh, M&Ms, the M&M candies. They started a, a, a whole new line of business where you can go online and actually design your own M&Ms. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, was, it was really quite a successful uh, thing. And it's, it, it's a great example, I think, of where you, you tend to think of something like a, a, a candy, an M&M, a Smarty, any of these kinds of candies out there as just generic, you know, they're little bites of deliciousness. But if you could actually put a message on it, like for mm. a wedding, for instance, is one of the use cases where many people used those, uh, then then it does bring in this emotional context and the emotional content. And then it does become much more of a kind of an artistry type of thing. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's an interesting challenge as as technology keeps moving ahead. We go through these phases where we move towards uh, kind of standardization for for various reasons, right? Not just uh, in terms of automation of manufacture, but also for transport, for selling, all these kinds of things. Uh, it, it it does a lot if you can make it standardized and make it easy for people to produce it, to sell it, to consume it, to dispose of it, to maintain it, all of these things. It, it's much easier if you can actually have it standardized. But of course, if you want it to be personalized, if you want it to have that extra emotional content, then uh, we need to maybe either move technology forward even further or bring in new technologies or take a step back. You know, there's been a movement towards kind of uh, reuse of goods. There's wonderful companies out there that do circular economy work, like Mud Jeans is one that I just happen to know about. And there you can, <clears throat> excuse me, after you're finished with your pair of jeans or you've outgrown them or whatever, you can send them back and they become sort of uh, the narrative of the previous owners becomes part of the history and part of the emotional content and the narrative literally of, of the jeans themselves. So it's a, a kind of an interesting uh, evolution of design and kind of this movement into and out of customization and standardization yeah that's interesting that hadn't, that hadn't struck me before that sort of the, the 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 confluence of industrial technologies manufacturing technologies and information technologies has has in some way permitted that um personalization um but you have to have very good manufacturing processes in the like you need to get those down. I'm, I, I'm, I'm thinking of you know Henry Ford saying you can have any any color car you like as long as it's black, right? <laughs> and then something similar happened with like the early um, Apple laptops, right? There or or um, and um, computers. They were all the same color, and then they said, oh well, we can we can make some variations on this, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You can get a rose gold iPhone, um, you know. And, and they were very very resistant to that until they knew you know they had the the scale that they needed and. Uh, they'd ironed out every other quirk, right? And they could add those flourishes and personalizations maybe. Um, exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it really is quite challenging to get the ability to actually customize things to that level, whether it's, you know, printing the individual person's name or message on the candy or on the iPhone itself. For a while, I remember when Apple introduced the ability to get your, your name <laughs> or whatever message you want on your iPhone, uh, that became a big deal for, for consumers out there. And it became a, another opportunity for them to make more money. Um, I, I have to, I have to ask now, do you have, um, a personalized message on an Apple device? <laughs> no, actually the first, I, the first, uh, oh, what was it? iPod I bought, I did get a little, just my name and email address. It wasn't really intended to be that customized. It was more, again, a functional mark on it. So it, I couldn't lose it. Or if I did lose it, I could, it could get back to me, so to speak. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I, I don't do a ton of work where I 
like things to be customized for me. I know some people do. Um, you know, some people like to actually have very customized things for me. I'm fine with uh, more of the functional side of things, I guess. Okay, very good. And um, how does the? I imagine there's got to be a lot of interplay between the designers and the engineers in this in this sort of a process. At least my experience of trying to build things has been you get some amazing designs and then you give them to the people who've got to build them and they're like, no, we can't do that. Um, is that something, has there been an evolution in how that process works? Is there better integration? Do you think, do we um, understand better now how to uh, not throw things over the fence as it were and actually work together to, to make realizable designs and beautiful yeah. products? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to say that we've made huge strides and that it's all sorted out now, but unfortunately, that really is not the case. Um, you know, a lot of my students for, who graduate from my human factors engineering programs, uh, they they end up going off to work in the design groups or the user experience groups of companies, and it's it's still shocking to me how often uh, th those types of um, well, the design process is often thought of as just something that's very much at the very beginning briefly and again at the very end so there are mm. companies that for which that's not true right there's a lot of kind of companies that are well known as design led companies and you know apple is one of the ones that initially was very much design led and they they still are to some extent although uh, i'm a little skeptical of how much of that is is uh, really a huge part of their uh, dna so to speak nowadays uh, dyson is another example from britain where there's uh, some lovely design that goes into every product um, so there is there's an acknowledged at least uh, spoken belief that there really has to be this interdisciplinary intergroup uh, collaborative effort where engineering and design business and marketing mm -hmm. all these groups kind of work together unfortunately there there is uh often a kind of bottleneck at various points for a while i worked at a company where i was more in the the kind of marketing group at the company and it was a technological solution provider etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, it was it was often the case that the marketing people were brought in only at the very end once they've kind of crafted the solution they give it to marketing to put the bells and whistles on to put the final little touches on and then of course at that point it's far too late and they realize that they've missed many of the features many of the functions that the actual end customers really wanted and mm. it's one of the one of the ways that designers marketers etc can really add huge value to design engineering equations right so if you're designing a fan functionally material wise there it's a pretty straightforward effort. Uh, but if you really want a fan uh, or whatever the product might be that is loved by the consumers and desired by the consumers and people are willing to pay a price for a premium price for, then you really need to understand the consumers, the customers, people are going to be using the product. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of the big challenges, I think, is that nowadays we can create things so well and we can design things so well and build them so quickly, etc., uh, that we can quite easily meet the functional needs of the consumers. Mm -hmm. The problem is so can our competitors. And so it, it very rapidly becomes sort of a race to generic cust uh, generic uh, solutions. So things like Amazon Basics is a classic example where you know they see there's these clever companies making these lovely solutions that people want. And so they build the Basics version, which functionally works the same, but doesn't have any of the other desired qualities. And uh, unfortunately, it then becomes a quick race to the bottom where it's just a commoditized um, products and people just, you know, charge less and less and less. And there's no way to differentiate yourself in that field. So even mm. from kind of a, a pure business perspective, it seems to me uh, that you really need to be bringing in the design and the marketing and really understanding who the users are and the consumers are and uh, things like that to get products that people really desire, not just that meet their functional needs. Mm. Yeah. I, I'm, so, I'm not too concerned that everything will become generic like those Amazon basics. And and the reason why is that and I don't know how much of the thing this is in the in the in the US, but you know, here we, in the supermarkets, we have for example, Tesco will have their Tesco finest range and they'll have their Tesco value range. And then they'll have like other ranges in between, like the market um Tesco market value, I don't know. There's I, I worked at Tesco many, many years ago. Um, and someone was explaining to me how much of a nightmare it was to maintain all these different um, brands, which were essentially the same product repackaged, um, you know, or at least coming from the same factories. I don't want to say, um, you know, that there wasn't differences in quality between them, but, you know, 
maybe there's a little bit of different flavoring or something in the Tesco value toothpaste to the finest toothpaste or what have you. But um, a lot of it was just because um, kind of people saw themselves as certain kinds of shoppers and went for a particular thing. And I, um, I mean, there they had made everything pretty generic to be fair. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think what it does um, signifies that people on the, you know, people choose to differentiate themselves in in different ways, um, and, and one of that is, is is through the kind of products that they um, opt to buy. Um, so I think there's there's always going to be room for that uniqueness, and in some ways, having the Amazon bakes, basics creates just like the the bland backdrop that you need for things to pop out maybe um yeah it's the it's the minimum level the mvp almost the, the or the minimum uh baseline level that any company has to meet uh, the challenge is for many companies to actually differentiate themselves enough so that they rise above that kind of baseline level right and, and that's a bit of a challenge uh if, especially if it is a product that is fairly commoditized right if it's just a I don't know, a, a charger for your phone or something like that. It's not something that's ten, that tends to be publicly displayed. It's not something that you tend to build your identity around. There's all these kind of psychological aspects of consumption and ownership. And if it's something that you can't really display, mm -hmm. can't really add deep value, then it's hard to really be a new company coming into that market and differentiating yourself in any way. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think there always will be, you know, opportunities for these kinds of um, novel design led companies and, and actually Statistically and from research, uh, there's been lots of studies that show that uh, market, uh, companies that are design-led tend to be much more successful. They tend to have um, higher stock value. They tend to have uh, they they tend to be more resilient for things mm. like recessions and things like that. So there are there are lots of good reasons to be sort of a design-led company, or at least to just be sure to bring the designers and the design process more more um, centrally into the development process, right? So if you think of the development mm. as the entire thing, the business and the research and all that kind of stuff, all the way to manufacturing, follow through, end of life, all of those things, uh, design really shouldn't just be a little slice done at a couple of points, but it really should be brought to the front, to the middle, and to the end of the process. Hmm. Yeah, I think design is a, a fascinating field, and it's one that I have been playing in and around now for 30 years. And it, it's it's always uh, fascinating to me how much of it is this interesting intersection between emotion, psychology, hmm. function. Um, you know, there's even, even I spent a few years working in the world of packaging. And again, there too, it's a great example where, you know, we often will tend to just tear off the package, the cardboard box and throw it in the bin and you move on. But the package itself has had huge amounts of uh, research and thought and design put in because it has to, of course, protect the product. It has to uh, create a brand message. It has to differentiate itself. It has to store, uh, store it on a shelf, has to work for transport. Mm -hmm. So there's always these different kind of dimensions and constraints that have to be met for even something as simple as a cardboard box, right? I mean, and even there, again, it's it's often commoditized and you just get this standard Amazon generic beige cardboard box comes to the house and that's fine. Uh, but then there are companies that do very clever things and they'll, they'll put their design and their branding all the way to things like, I don't know if you've seen them, but there's like the barcodes and sometimes there'll be messages hidden in the barcodes or the barcodes will make a shape. Uh, and mm -hmm. there's subtle things like that that actually can uh, quite effectively differentiate one product from another and create sort of moments of connection between the consumer and the product etc so yeah it's a fascinating area the the world of design yeah maybe before i i think we're gonna soon move on to uh, another topic but maybe as a nice segue into that i mean you, you mentioned just now all these kind of dimensions that you have to take into account and um you have a nice kind of name for that um but can you take us through yeah some of the time i guess some of the techniques that you would try to um grok all those things right how, how do we um sort of navigate the the rich the or you know the overly rich landscape perhaps of constraints that 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 designers have to work with yeah, I mean, it, it, that's an area that I've been sort of uh, thinking about and playing in for quite some time now. And I guess the, the most sort of structured method that I've come up with is what I call multidimensional task analysis is one example. And um, the idea there is that uh, there, there's the concept of task analysis, which goes you know, well, in some sense, goes back forever. But at least in t uh, the early Industrial Revolution, think people like Taylor um, 
had this whole concept of Taylorism where you could uh, analyze a task. Let's say it's on an assembly line and you want to assemble a particular part of a car and you could go through all the specific physical motions that are required to do that task. Um, and uh, that, that same process was then applied to things that are more cognitive. So you had physical task analysis looking at building on an assembly line. Then you can have cognitive task analysis where you look at how someone's filling in a form, uh, for instance, on a website. Uh, and those are the sort of physical and cognitive task analysis. And over the last, I guess, five or 10 years, I've been trying to expand that into other forms of task analysis. So uh, one, there's one, for instance, which is emotional task analysis, where you study very carefully all the emotions that might arise as someone is going through a task. So an example there would be, for instance, if you go to a website and you decide to buy something, you go to the credit card form, just when you're about to put in the credit card information, you're probably a little bit tentative about mm -hmm. that bit unsure. And you know, if you do a, a detailed emotional task analysis, you'll realize that at that point in time, there's this, this emotion that arises, which is um, fear, skepticism, uncertainty. And so as a designer, you could think, well, so that that is now part of my design landscape. What can I do to, in this case, let's say to lessen that emotion? And so for instance, you could put the verified by trust E logos, all these kind of 56 bit encryption, all these kinds of messages there on that page, just to kind of help uh, ameliorate or lessen that emotion, that negative emotion. And similarly, you can do the same for positive emotions. You know, someone's gone through and they've created an account. Isn't that great? They must be quite happy. And from a design perspective, if you if you did your emotional task analysis, you'd realize that, okay, right now there's a positive emotion. Let's see what we can do to boost that up a little bit. And so you could have a king, congratulations, confetti goes flying in the background or whatever. And, you know, you've created an account and it sounds silly. It sounds stupid. It sounds small, but those kind of small emotional touch points can have a huge impact on uh, someone's connection to a website or their experience with a product. Uh, same with, again, back to packaging, things like that. If you think about opening the package, at some point there'll be frustration when you can't figure out how to open the package. And, you know, again, as a designer, you should think, well, okay, so right now they get the package and they don't know how to open it. They can't tell where the pull tab is. Let's make their life easier. Let's get rid of that negative emotional state somehow. And the, the nice thing about multidimensional task analysis is, is sort of the fancy name I've given this way of thinking, but uh, it really is just, it, it helps identify moments in time where there are, for instance, emotions or physical challenges or cognitive challenges. And it doesn't give you an answer, but it tells you here's a place you should now focus your artistry and skill to look for solutions. Uh, there's a, another task analysis that I've been trying to forward and shepherd is the idea of in, informational task analysis or decisional task analysis, just basically trying to understand a process that someone's going through and look for ways to facilitate it, to make it smoother. Uh, ideally, you'd have uh, all of the complications just disappear, right? You want design that becomes invisible. It's one of the kind of goal of design is that becomes something that people don't even notice. It's it's quite simple. It's effortless. It's magical, uh, and and you, it often requires structured ways of thinking to be able to do that kind of design. And of course, one of the the big areas that that has championed that is the whole world of design thinking, led by people like at IDEO and companies like that. Design thinking is another process where it's sort of focuses on the user, looks for uh, emotionality, looks for touch points, relationships, things like that, and tries to design products, services, experiences, processes that that kind of make that person delighted and gets rid of any problems that they might have. So uh, there's lots of ways that that you can actually look at all the different dimensions of a design task and systematically try to identify opportunities and ways to correct or to kind of tweak the experience let's say the, the other thing that makes it quite interesting is the opportunity of using new technologies and new tools to do that kind of design right so i mentioned uh, these different forms of task analysis, but you know, one of the one of the latest entrants into this world of tools for designers is are, are things like LLMs. Things mm. like ChatGPT has been uh, in my world has has really captivated my attention for the last six months or so as as a tool that could be used in this same type of design process. This is one of the things that really excites me. And I'm curious, was there a particular aspect of ChatGPT which got you thinking this could work well for design. One thing I'm particularly thinking about is the the idea of personas within design. I, I, I guess that's sort of something that that's part and parcel of the design thinking way of, of, of doing things to 
identify we're talking earlier about you know a four-year-old a mug made for a four-year-old i mean that's a fun persona to think about um but you 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 try to set on very specific platonic ideals of the the the, the sort of person that would be using your your product and chat gpt and other llms seem to be very good at imagining that they're anyone right you can you can give them any bizarre Yes. combination of characteristics and they will do a really good job at trying to be i don't know um you know donald j chump but also a rapper right or uh you know whatever 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 you want exactly. um, yeah i mean that, that that is one of the things that actually in, in a sense uh made me start to think about using chat gpt and other llms I'll, I'll just say chat gpt and keep dropping the and other llms i'll just use that as an, a generic example so like in chat gpt you know there were there was lots of buzz when it first came out about how you can use it to make up stories and of course mm -hmm. in the world of design thinking storytelling is one of the best tools that design thinkers have they make up a, a narrative they make up a story about you know this is pat and they are a 42 year old office worker, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, you can make up a nice story. And that really is a, a huge part of the research, even though it may mm -hmm. not seem it, for design thinking and for the design process as a whole. If you really want to empathize with your end user, if you want to understand what their pains are, what their dreams, fears, loves, aspirations, relationships, et cetera, are, you, one of the ways to get there is by starting to tell narratives. And, you know, as humans, it's a way to kind of convey emotion, to convey understanding etc so llms of course early on this was one of the things that came out is chat gpt was great at telling stories and so uh, i started playing around with it as a tool to build personas uh, and it, it worked fabulously well and the, the nice thing about chat gpt uh, well there's, there's some downsides of course so it makes things up it hallucinates it you know fills in the blanks it's a it's a great improviser but that's both a blessing and a curse right so it's some people hate that they don't want it making up information but if you're trying to build realistic personae and if you want to try mm -hmm. to develop better products having having a tool that can actually make up narratives that are based on true stories you know so it's almost like a made for a tv movie or something you know inspired mm -hmm. by true events made and that that really is uh, how i think about chat gpt it's not i don't take anything it says as canonical truth but if i ask it to describe the average uh, uh, let's say the start of the work day for an average mcdonald's worker you know tell me about a mcdonald's worker and how they start their day what happens when they arrive mm -hmm. at their workplace, it'll tell me stuff. And I'm not, I don't ever believe that it's 100% accurate and will describe everyone out there because you know there's no single story that will describe everyone. But it does a great job of kind of building an informed narrative. And that, that often is uh, enough to get the design process really going. Mm. Uh, and so that, that's one of the ways that you could start to use ChatGPT. But um, you know, I started to think about it as a mechanism for exploring stories that uh, could go in any number of dimensions, right? So back to mm. the, the whole concept of multiple dimensions, right? So I could say, tell me about the emotional experiences of that McDonald's worker, or tell me about um, their functional challenges, or tell me about the worst day or the best day. You can you can sort of ask ChatGPT to take you on any little narrative adventure you want. Uh, and so that that's where it started to get really interesting to me, is to think about using ChatGPT as a, as a tool to explore spaces, multidimensional spaces. And, mm. and that kind of led to sort of uh, my metaphor about chat GPT as a glider, in a sense, mm -hmm. through these, um, an infinite dimensional glider, it can take you on an emotional journey or a narrative journey, it can tell you stories about anything from chocolate to automobiles to, you know, the next generation smartphone, and you can use it to do an an informed exploration and informed in the sense that it was trained on you know, basically everything ever written by people, not really. And uh, it doesn't remember any of that kind of stuff, but it, it's been informed by it. It's sort of, it's like someone who heard all the songs and has forgotten all the words, but if you ask them to, you know, to kind of hum a few bars of something that's jazzy, they can do that pretty well. They've heard every song. They can kind of do something like a a jazzish song, or they can do something that's folksy or something that has a kind of Celtic air to it, whatever it might be. Uh, and that's very much how I start started to think about ChatGPT as a multi-dimensional glider that lets you explore these spaces. Yeah. And of course that one of the really nice features of this metaphor is it gives a really um a good handle on how to make use of, of ChatGPT. Um in that 
you know, some of the other metaphors, and I think it'd be fun to talk about some of the others out there. But for example, a stock, this famous stochastic parrot um, metaphor, you know, th- th- there's truth to it. Like that, that, that probably does a fairly good job in a sense of capturing how it was generated, like how it was built. You know, it's it's just taking information that's that, that it's been given, and it's 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 running some statistical operations on that information. But it doesn't really give you, you know, if you really believed it was a stochastic parrot, you would have to know the answers that you wanted from it, right? <laughs> you would just give it the answer that you expect and expect to get something slightly different back. Like that's what you get with parrots. They just repeat yes. you. Um, but it doesn't do that at all. Like it, it it does act something more like this glider where you set it up with a kind of flight path that it's going to take. Um and it's going to go through those topics and, and try to, I don't know, m- make the most sensible journey through that. Um, and the other metaphor that I've, I've seen you use is it's like a little kind of robot picking up words. <laughs> so so if we kind of combine those, it's kind of like a, a glider that's it's moving through these spaces and picking up what it thinks are, are going to be the words that 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 work together best uh, yeah. and, you know, kind of summarize that that journey best. Um, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And, and and just to kind of follow on the the robot glider things I mean the robot metaphor is one that I I, I like to use just because it has this lovely mental image it, it's like a little wind up <laughs> robot like one of those walking robots from the 1950s 60s I don't know where you wind it up and it just walks along on the ground and that's really kind of what chat GPT is you wind it up and you aim it in a direction this is kind of how I like to think about it, you know, okay, I'm going to aim you in the direction of um, a narrative about a four-year-old who wants to drink some apple juice. And and you kind of wind the robot up and aim it in the direction of narrative four-year-old space. <laughs> if there is such a space there, you know, we're in a billion dimensional space. So you aim it in that direction and it walks along and it leaves behind itself a little, a little tail, a little stream of words and that that is the story about the four-year-old who wants apple juice and it's it's incredibly useful if you're trying to design a cup for a four-year-old who wants to drink something uh, it's quite useful it it, it kind of to me it, it didn't quite have the right image just because it's such a high dimensional space that chat gpt can walk you through right you can ask it to walk you through any bit of a space that you want and it'll it'll go there um and so uh the the other side of things that i think the, the robot metaphor fails to capture is kind of the idea of there being a, a topology and influence to the way the robot walks. And so the glider, I like to think of this as being sort of influenced by stars, let's say it's navigating or influenced by the winds. Hmm. Uh, so it, that, that to me is how I try to think of the concept of context as people often talk about. So in ChatGPT, um, an example that I uh, talk about sometimes is this idea that let, let's say I ask ChatGPT to give me um, four behavior change interventions that might help reduce cancer rate in rural communities. And if you go to ChatGPT and type that, you'll get some some pretty good answers. It'll give you some uh, some lovely examples of interventions and behavior change that you could do to reduce cancer rates, et cetera, et cetera. And that's fine. But that's like putting the glider and just saying, okay, hey, glider, Behavior change is sort of way up there, off in space. Use that to guide your path as you move through space. And, and it, it, it will do that. But it basically, I don't know, intuitively, I think of it as like a vector representation. So somehow when you say there's a constellation over there, which is behavior change, keep, keep your eye on that as you fly your narrative tales. It'll do it. But it'll do a much better job if you first ask it to really explore that bit of constellational space, almost like, you know, magnify that for a second. And so one of the ways that that I like to do that is I'll ask ChatGPT first, before I ask it for behavior change interventions, I'll say, okay, ChatGPT, there are many behavior change interventions out there. Can you please consider all of them and group them into six clusters and present to me the six clusters, name each cluster, and give me two examples of behavior change interventions within each of those clusters. Uh, and it does all of that. It does a great job. I, I tend not to even read about 90% of what it, it tells me because partly what I'm doing there is I'm really just trying to get it to activate or to sort mm. of highlight or get a yeah. richer understanding of that particular dimension. And then you could say, okay, can you now give me behavior change interventions to reduce cancer rates in rural communities? And it'll do a much more nuanced job. It sort of has reminded it or 
forced it to remember that there's actually a lot of interesting depth and richness in that little bit of space, which I was earlier referring to as behavior change, and which maybe in, in mathematical sense, maybe it was sort of represented as just a couple of vectors way off in billion dimensional space. That's kind of roughly what behavior change is. So let's use that to guide our journey through space. If you instead say, hey, tell me all about that space and give me a little journey, a little walk through behavior change space, then it's representational vectors of that bit of space are much richer and you'll have a much more nuanced glide as you explore behavior change interventions to reduce cancer rates or whatever the case might be. Yeah. Yeah. You're sort of, you're kind of priming it. Like, uh, I mean, we're mixing many metaphors here or, or another way of thinking about it might be you're sort of you're trying to sort of mold a persona or, or pick out a persona or a a personality uh, or a, from within it. And then you're asking of that, um, your yes. question. One thing I really like about ChatGPT, and we discussed this previously, um, versus the the other, some of the other LLMs, I mean, particularly Bard, um, uh, not, not so much Claude, but both Claude and ChatGPT have this, ability to have maintain separate conversations yes. and those aren't just you know those are independent things you're you're actually using a different instance of the 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 agent the context window so yeah it, it, i mean some kind of nice you can do very silly things with that like you can just say okay in this in this chat everything i ask you translate it into emo emojis like and nothing else yes. <laughs> and then any yeah, yeah. yeah confirm you've understood uh please reply yes and that's the only yes you'll get. And then every other sentence you write, it gives you just emojis. And that's uh, that's rather fun. Or you can get something, you know, that just corrects your texts or just, I don't know, you can say, I want you to be my friend in this window. <laughs> Hmm, Whatever, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I have one that uh, knows a lot about my own inner personal uh, struggles. I kind of use it as a bit of a therapist. I've told them oh, about cool. some like uh, aspirations, what matters to life, what matters to me in life, what what I consider important, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I can go there sometimes if I'm feeling down, say, "Hey, I'm a bit depressed today," and it gives me a wonderful little pep talk because it knows what matters to me and what my concerns are, things like that. Actually, one of the things that that got me really uh, thinking about this was uh, one of my kids, my oldest kid, uh, he is a student uh, and he was telling me how he has a different conversation for each of the classes he's taking. Mm. That made me realize, oh, of course, that that makes sense. you know. And it's one of the things, like you said, that I'm, I'm disappointed that many of the other LLMs haven't really incorporated is this ability to have multiple agents, multiple conversations, however you think of it, right? So um, I, I, do, I do teach various classes. And so I do have a different chat for each of my classes. And it, it that chat has read my syllabus. It knows all the classic papers in that particular domain. And so I could say, hey, I here's you've seen my current syllabus. Can you give me a syllabus that is uh, a little bit better than that one and also includes uh, elements of DEIJ, diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and it'll do that, right? I mean, it, it, you really need to have these conversations that have not just the context, but also the the relevant uh, bits of all knowledge highlighted and and primed. Like you said, I, I do think priming is is kind of the right way to think of it here. That it, if you don't tell ChatGPT what you want it to use to guide your journey, it won't really know. So one of the classic examples now is this idea that many people will say, pretend you're a medical doctor and tell me about, and give me a healthy eating plan. And it'll do that. And it's much better than if you just say, give me a healthy eating plan. Right? If you say, give me a healthy <laughs> plan, it's generic. If you say, pretend you're a medical doctor and give me a healthy eating plan, it's much better. Um, if you say, pretend you're a medical doctor and pretend I am a 57 year old man and blah, blah, blah it'll do a better still. Mm -hmm. That's the more information that chat has, the better. I, I think, and I haven't, I haven't done enough experimenting to know for sure, but I'm pretty certain that just saying, pretend you're a medical doctor will not be nearly as effective as if you first said, medical doctors know many different things. Can you give me eight clusters of types of things that medical doctors know? And then it'll do it. And then you say, okay, can you tell me about 
six clusters or six types of things that medical doctors know about health and nutrition. And it'll do that as well. And then if you ask it to give you some medical or some healthy eating advice, it'll be a much richer, much mm. better uh, advice, right? If you ask it to just pretend you are a medical doctor, it's okay, but it uses a very rough course representation of medical doctor uh, versus activating that kind of representation or that space in a much deeper and richer way. Yeah. And th this idea of clustering is a really nice way of quickly getting it to prime itself. Um, right. And, and you can even, or you can then of the, if it's a medical doctor and you're saying, okay, well, give me the types of medical, you know, the types of expertise that a doctor would have or the types of doctors there are, you can then choose among those yourself and say, That's please right. focus on, on this one. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's, it, it, I'm intrigued because of course, clustering is something that um, machine learning has been used for for many years, but we've used, you know, very specific ways of doing that, um, kind of k-means or, or something like that. And um, but now you can just kind of ask it to do some clustering over anything, right? <laughs> you can, right yeah. um, so it's a really interesting way of, of figuring out our own conceptual um, boundaries and, like, you know, what is the right I don't know the right way of clustering the sciences. If you asked it for put, hmm. put all sciences into three sciences or eight sciences, you'll get very different answers. Um, yes. And of course, it's not telling you something fundamental about science, but it's telling you something fundamental about how we think about, it. like how exactly. all of cultural <laughs> hmm. uh, heritage or where exactly. everything has been fed um, sort of represents the world. Um, yes. It's almost like um, this is the first time I've thought of this but it's almost like the ordinary language philosophers <laughs> that were um working in the sort of 50s and, and around then in in um in the uk in particular um particularly yeah. in, in oxford and and they were they were doing things like where would i use i mean a classic example is uh jl austin talking about three well ways of spilling ink and he says you can spill ink accidentally um, you can do it, um, sorry, you can do it intentionally on purpose or deliberately. And one might just say, okay, well, those are the same thing, right? Yes. There's no difference between those. But then he goes through a series of thought experiments and says, oh, in this, you know, in this circumstance, you would have said that it was done deliberately, but it was still un, you know, but it wasn't intentional. Right. Um, mm. and he comes up with these kind of, and you do find yourself agreeing on, like, yeah, actually that would be. You know, this is the appropriate use of language, and the point is, um, you know, our language has sort of meaning that we don't ourselves, we're, we're not able to surface unless we think about it, and reflect on it, um, and of course, all that or much of that meaning in language is is now encoded in 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 ChatGPT, other LMs, and we can do kind of those sort of experiments and and try to tease out like the way that our concepts fit together. So, um, yes. yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it is one of the, I mean, I, uh, I spent a year studying at King's College in London and uh, uh, philosophy. I was a philosophy major at the time, and I, I got very into Wittgenstein. And I think it's one of the things that sort of has informed some of my ways of thinking about mm -hmm. and understanding what ChatGPT and other LLMs do, right? I mean, it, 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 and sort of a, a way of thinking about the stochastic parrots type of mm. critique. I don't know, I, I, I personally don't find those all that compelling. I think that there's some... Mm -hmm. um, some uh, misunderstanding of the way language functions and and the way that uh, we use, interpret, and understand language. Right. So it, even if it's a parrot uh, and it doesn't understand meaning, etc., and you know that it's more to me, it's more a question of what it inspires in the mind of the hearer or the user. It's a uh, it's kind of yeah. that you know I, I don't think ChatGPT knows anything deep about behavior change but if it can put symbols on paper that inspire in the mind of a a, a human <laughs> ideas for behavior change that's good enough for me you know i don't i don't think that the meaning needs to be in the mind of the parrot the, if the meaning is in the mind of the hearer the user the person who's going to make kind of use of that information then that's probably good enough uh, whether there's real meaning i don't even think you know from a, a kind of a wittgenstein perspective i don't even know what real meaning would be like in the mind of an llm right so it's yeah. kind of a weird bewitched by language kind of thing to say that there's no real understanding no real meaning in there well i don't even know what real meaning would be like in yeah 
in an LLM. <laughs> I think, I think, we, yeah, we struggle with this in humans, right? Exactly. We've not figured it out. We've had thousands of years to think about this. We've been thinking about this for thousands of years. Um, yeah, and um, I mean, Wittgenstein himself sort of like uh, changed his mind about this, and it, yes. uh, you know, the meaning of the word is its application. Um, I th- it's the use of language game. Exactly. So yeah, if 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 the LLM can apply to words correctly, then it's it's got <laughs> exactly. the meanings down, I guess. That's, that's um, yeah, it's kind yeah. Of an interesting way of thinking about it. I mean, I, I guess I, I I'm I just think. ChatGPT again, or LLMs in general, are really the most powerful tool that humans have created. As as kind of cognitive prosthetics is somehow uh, mm. somehow how people talk about them, you know, as a, as a tool to help inspire new ideas, new directions, new understanding. They're just fabulous. I mean, I I, I refer to these things now as glides, kind of the glider metaphor. And so, you know, I've, I've gone on glides through so many fascinating spaces, right? Everything from medicine to social impact, to physics, to engineering, machine learning. And, and in each case, uh, it, I found that ChatGPT has, has, taken me on wonderful journeys to new insights and new discoveries, right? So it's not really that it, I don't know, I go back and forth. My, my friends, I, I always say, you won't believe what ChatGPT has done tonight. And they say, well, you mean what you've done with ChatGPT? And they, they yeah, kind of yeah. me. And I, I guess there is some some artistry to the pilots, someone who's flying the glider, just to follow on this metaphor that's probably getting annoying at this point. But, you know, there, there is, there is a, some kind of human involvement that helps it helps guide it into interesting novel spaces. And, you know, this is maybe let's hope that one of the ways that humans will continue to serve a a functional value in society, we won't lose all of our jobs because we'll still need some humans who can actually help fly the machine, right? It's like, it's a pretty powerful machine, but you still need humans to add that kind of sense to it. Yeah, it is interesting. And it is kind of, that the way that we talk about it, the language that we use, we we very much. And this is because of the way it's been designed to act um, or you know respond in very human like ways. It 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 could convey much of the information, uh, you know, in more robotic <laughs> sort of All speech. Of the lists. Yeah. Um, but so it is very tempting to sort of embody it with some or um, endow it with some agency, which yes. is not something that we would. We, we we do with other cognitive pr- prosthetics um computers in, in in general uh and i think it's it's both a blessing and a curse it's one of the yeah. you know one of my one of my big complaints about um from from a human factors perspective right we have this idea of a mental model of how something works right so we have a mental mm. model of what cpr does and how you how you should do it or what a mental model of how i don't know whatever uh, microsoft word or google docs email, how all of these things work. You have some mental model uh, and and they tend to get triggered by symbols in the environment. So, you know, if you see a search box, you go and you type a search term and you search. And, and I think that um, OpenAI and ChatGPT have kind of done a disservice to the power of LLMs in that they've just put what looks like a search box. And so uh, I'm, I'm always disappointed how many of my friends and colleagues have been have been unhappy with ChatGPT because they went there and they tried to search and it didn't really give them very good stuff. It was sort of generic search results with a, a facade of humanness added on top. And it's like, well, that is where OpenAI AI screwed up. They they gave an interface that really does look like a search box, and so people unfortunately think that what this is is a search engine and um, even colleagues of mine in computer science say well you know it's really just it's another form of wikipedia or another form of google and it's like well no unfortunately they put the wrong user interface there so you think it is that but you you failed to understand it's actually something much different from that it's something that you know if if you want it to respond as a human it can if you ask it to respond as a robot it can if you ask it to only give you you know bulletless structured outputs it can do that as well it it can it can be um kind of configured to respond any way you want and to explore any space you want i mean that again that as a as a glider explorer um, i had it i did some some wonderful uh, let's see i had it rewrite the final season of game of thrones and it you know, <laughs> i actually asked it to give me three versions uh, three possible out, uh, three, outlined three different versions of the final season of game of thrones every one of them was 
10 times better, I must say, you know, I'm biased, et cetera, but to, than, the, than the real one that actually was created. And, and some of them were so beautifully nuanced and subtle and things like that. Uh, it, and you know, you can explore anything. What would happen if Harry Potter appeared in the world of Game of Thrones? And from ChatGPT's perspective, I don't want to anthropomorphize it too much. That's just another glide through a space. It's a space that's informed by everything that's been ever written about Harry Potter and everything that's ever been written about Game of Thrones. And it's a pretty informed space that it can glide you through if you ask it to you know write a poem about how harry potter encountered i don't i'm actually not that much of a fan of either of those genres but uh it, it knows everything about those it knows more than any human about each of those spaces <laughs> and you know if you wanted to find the world's expert on each of those and ask the the experts to come up with a narrative thing basically chat gpt is kind of like that it's it's uh it is it's read everything it's read all the fan fiction about all of those things as well so anyway it's it, it from a uh, as a as an infinite dimensional glider or explorer it's just an incredible tool now again you have to be careful because all of that is just improvisation it's it's making it up as it goes along uh, if mm. you ask it to solve a complicated maths problem it'll do the same kind of thing it's kind of it's kind of read some mathy stuff here and some other mathy stuff there and so it'll kind of weave up weave up a tale that seems face plausible uh, but it may be totally wrong and if, if you're in a field where getting the absolute perfect facts matters um, and if you're in a field where getting the facts matters and you also don't spend the time to review what it's telling you uh, then you're in trouble right it's not mm. it's not really trustworthy for those kinds of things but if you wanted to put together a first draft of something that you then intend to use your human sense and sensibility and expertise to review and edit and um, add references to etc it's fabulous for doing that kind of stuff yeah it, it, it's incredible how it's managed to learn maths i mean it, you know it's mm. not being programmed in it's just yeah. picked up on the patterns um yeah for programming can, especially yeah. yeah computer programming it's incredible for that yeah yeah uh, uh, yeah computer programming absolutely and this i william gibson um commented once that uh you know, in, in the industrial revolution, you need a lot of money to start a factory, right? You need a capital. And yes. now you just start, you know, anyone can start a factory. You just get a laptop, right? And you can build software. You you, you still need to put people in that factory. If you don't know how to code, right? <laughs> like, yes. or, or, or if you know, even if you do know how to code, you're only one person, but, and, and you know, probably you know, adapted a limited number of languages, but now we've, you know, ChatGPT has sort of given us um, workers, right? And I, I have all these uh, sort of crazy ideas uh, that I occasionally jot down of, oh, wouldn't it be fun to, um, I don't know, um, what's the one I was doing the other day? Oh yeah, just, just build some, uh, I, I, Build a simulation um, of the game of life, like build the game of life, you know, Conway's game of life, but using QR codes as the starting point. Um, so this is something, actually, again, pick this up from Christian Book, who does this in one of his books. He kind of shows how after a few generations, a QR code will have just become a few different um, dots, right? It will have lost all its kind of uh, uh, interest in general if you propagate it under the Conway's rule, yes. of, rule of life. Um, rules. Um, so I was like, well, it'd be fun to make a video of that happening. But, you mm. know, that's going to take too much time, right? Um, or uh, it would be fun to uh, create some like a periodic, you know, these a periodic, a periodic, let me say this correct, a periodic tiles like the Penrose tiling and stuff like that. And there's been a new one discovered recently. I like, wouldn't be fun to see those tiles being animated or to play with different um, versions of that. But oh, yeah, I, I, I could do that, but it would just take quite a lot of coding. But now you just say, you don't, you know, you just say, okay, um, you know, I want a QR code which encodes this and please, um, you know, then treat it as a series of black dots and then propagate those dots according to the rules of the game of life and then, you know, turn that into a, a video GIF. And it just does that in, in, in five minutes. And yes. uh, it, it's, it's incredible. incredible. Like you can just, <laughs> you know. Um, it is it is funny. I, I feel often uh, when we're talking about things like this, I, I just fall into this kind of fanboy kind of thing, if that's the right term. You know, it's like, oh, it's just amazing. It's wonderful. And it, and it really is. But uh 
one of the reasons I think it's so wonderful is, you know, we can do that kind of stuff, but just thinking what that means on kind of a societal scale that mm. now any computer programmer um, can, you know, be 10 times as powerful and, 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 and any, for instance, from a, um, an equity perspective, there are some kids and, and this is where it gets difficult, right? So there are some kids in uh, middle school, high school, youngish kids who just are not very good writers. Now, should that be a required skill for them to get out of universe? Should they, should that be required for them to be able to be productive, successful members of society, or is it okay for them to have chat GPT do that? Well, I don't know. I mean, when you start to think about what it's capable of, uh, I, I have this weird vision of a future where everything will be entirely different. And, and if we accept the power of chat GPT and start to use it. And, and, and also I should say that, you know, I, I know that as it is now, it, it has all kinds of problems. It hallucinates, it has errors, et cetera, et cetera. But again, I, I don't, I'm not really thinking about the now I'm thinking about the five years from now. I, I can't even imagine what two years mm. from now, or one year from now is going to be like, partly because of this interesting non-linearity here. Right. So now that mm. now that the people who are building LLMs and all of the other kinds of AI informed agents, now that they have access to something as powerful as chat GPT and as powerful as all the other tools that are out there, uh, it, it accelerates everything in this interesting non-linearity. So things, um, if, if you look at, I've, I've been thinking that if you look at the evolution of human um, creativity, let's say you make a timeline going from you know, 10,000 years ago to 10,000 years from now, and you graph out a uh, number of new inventions, happiness, flourishing, artistic creations, etc. It'll all go along and you know things will happen. But at this point in November, December of 2020, 2022, I guess, uh, when ChatGPT was released, there's going to be this just incredible acceleration in the mm. productivity of everything. That, that's my hunch. Uh, unfortunately, of course, the downside of all that is there'll also be an acceleration in um, things like terrorist actions and you know, un, uh, biological weapon development. I mean, ChatGPT can really be used by anyone. My, my contention in the strong sense, which I don't entirely agree with, but I, I, I do pretty much think that ChatGPT can help anyone do anything they want to do better. Uh, and I, and I, I'm, I'm scared about the ability, you know, it, it can help a terrorist do a terrorist action better. It can help a physician do a surgery better. I mean, it, it, unfortunately, there's no uh, real difference in the sense of it as a tool. It can help anyone do whatever they want to do better. And, and again, like I say, it's not entirely true, but um, you know, you, there's been some wonderful uses of things like uh, using ChatGPT to, to design better, um, let's say, syllabus or training if you want to learn how to be a chef. You can ask ChatGPT to give you a six-month specific uh, uh, learning schedule that will take you through different skills you need to become a chef. If you want to become mm. a surgeon, it can help you develop. You know, if you want to learn how to whistle, it can mm. do all the steps required. It can make you a master whistler. It can put together a five-year plan to make you the world's best whistler. Now, whether it is accurate or not, I'm not sure. It'll do a pretty good job of getting you somewhere pretty close. And so it's 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 just hard to imagine where this power of um, this tool will actually take us in, mm. in the couple of years well well i hope it is more down the whistling route rather than the biohazards yeah i i think greg brockman um of open ai gave a very good uh I, I think the strongest thing that he said about why they decided to release chat gpt was that all the tools were there all, all the pieces were there they you know all the compute the um and even the science right was was pretty public access and you know the the d the t in chat gpt famously comes from google and you know all those ai guys have been that it, it's in their contracts that they're able they're able to publish and that's how they've managed to kind of attract attract them that's just how this world is is working right it's very much in the public and so their, their rationale was, we sort of need to release this as early as possible when uh, and give ourselves enough time to, to figure out how to use it and time to live with it instead of letting it become super duper powerful. And, you know, maybe just someone keeps it to themselves 
um, mm, yeah. or, or even they release it publicly, but we don't have this kind of ability to um, figure out how to use it and, and create kind of an, an equilibrium, I guess. Um, and I think one of the one of the arguments that is used by the optimists uh, around superintelligence is that we'll will not end up with a single superintelligence. We'll have kind of lots of different ones, and actually that it won't be so different from the world that we're currently living in where we have many large corporations, which each one of which one, one can think of as a, as a super intelligence insofar as it's, you know, able to, to somehow produce things that no individual in that, in that um, organization could, even if they were given sort of a million years of life, probably. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that was a good call on open AI's part. And I certainly see that they, they almost had no choice, as they said, right? All the pieces were there. Someone had to to do this. Uh, if there's anyone at fault here, it's just that no government was really far-sighted enough to put in regulation uh, much earlier on, uh, unlike what what happened in in um, genetics research. I would I would say, um, yes. yeah. I mean, I, I do. I don't know. I, it, it, this is a tough one as well. I love ChatGPT. I love having access to it. So I'm very grateful that they did release it, but I am very worried about where it might go. And I am very worried about, um, you know, how malicious actors might be able mm. to use. Um, I do think that it would have probably been a better choice to have waited some amount of time and to, for instance, brought together some uh, ethicists, some panels of experts to decide what the right ways to release this might be. Um, you know, there's in in the U.S., for instance, in every country, pretty much. There, if you have a new medical device or a new medicine, yeah. etc., you, you don't just release it to the public. So I can see yeah. kind of pros and cons that that you won't really know the extent of it, uh, and you won't really be able to kind of engage in a full, uh, a fully informed, let's say, analysis of it until you get lots of voices involved. So it, it's kind of nice that they did release it to get lots of voices involved, but it does feel a little bit like, um, you know, well, it's not quite the same, but I'll give you another parallel example from the world of human factors, which is um, I'm, I'm quite, I have a, an interesting love hate with Tesla and Elon Musk, et cetera. And as a company, they make some wonderful decisions, but from a wearing my human factors engineer hat, uh, I'm really frustrated that they basically have decided to release the vehicle to the world and let humans out in the world be the usability testers. You know, in, in the world of software development, there is a profession out there, a usability researcher, user experience designer. There's, you know, most uh, software products before they come to market, if, if it's coming from a, a well-designed-led, again, back to the design-led kind of company, they'll have a team of, of um, user experience researchers, um, user interface designers, and people who are experts who can actually do bring in uh, people and have them do usability testing, look for problems with the product, look for ways to make it better, look for ways to improve it. Uh, and you know, you go through these iterations where you catch some bugs and you then put it back to the design development team and they make a new version. And all of that really should happen in-house before it's released to the public. Somehow, my belief is that Tesla has decided that that would be too difficult to really do, uh, you know, and, and partly I can see their point, right? You can't get every combination of atmospheric conditions, road conditions, human pedestrians, et cetera. At some point you do just kind of have to put it out there and, and let reality be the user testers of it. But, but I, I do think that there are some, some ways in which you really should have done some of that testing internally though. So Tesla's really should not have, uh, you know, there's a lot of aspects, for instance, of the user interface, the screen, the mm -hmm. display that, that are horrible and that any usability expert could tell, could have told them these are horrible. And if they had done usability testing, they would have found that people fail, people uh, perform actions and make mistakes that actually could lead to death. But they didn't do any of that. They just decided to eh, put it out on the roads and let's see what happens. And, and I think that is a, a little irresponsible. Uh, again, it's, it's and, and I think ChatGPT is kind of the same way that, that mm. this is a tool that's incredibly powerful. I don't know if it was really ready to be released to the public to let the public see, you know, let's see if terrorists can figure out how to use it. Let's see if, you know, people who have malicious intents can use it to design crimes, etc. And they did, of course, put in, there are guardrails in place. I've spent a lot of time kind of pushing the guardrails to see what I can get around it. And, you know, there's lots of famous tales about people who have found clever ways around these guardrails. And it, it's kind of worrying that there are mm. 
pretty easy workarounds um, yeah. in many cases. But but yeah, so in terms of releasing it to the public, I go back and forth. I, I, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more internal testing and a little bit more guardrail uh, developments before it was actually released to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. I, I Well, on the guardrails, I, I, it's not proven, but I, I certainly think it's likely that there's just fundamentally impossible to build. Um, yes. I agree. Yeah. yeah, completely impenetrable guardrails in a way that, you know, you know, one might say, oh, well, that's true of all software, right? You know, you yes. can always kind of crack codes. But I, I think it's it's different to, um, you know, the way that one can encrypt, at least until we get quantum computers, like one can, you know, create pretty good encryption of, 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 of things um, that, you know, you can, you can so, you can mathematically prove you're just not going to break that encryption. Again, unless we have like a way of factorizing large primes very quickly, which we 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 would with quantum computers, um, you know, we can understand all that. We just fundamentally the way that LLMs work is, um, you know, they're they're not debuggable. Um, they are kind of you know loosely structured on the way that minds work. They're a simplification, um, but they're certainly inspired by the architecture of of, of neurons in the mind. And if there's one thing that we don't understand, it's the human mind. Um, so if you want to make something that's understandable and um, you know uh, infallible, uh, you don't base it on that, right? But if you want to make something that's creative yes. and is able yes. to learn, yeah, um, nice. that's the way to go. Um, yeah. So I mean, I think there's, I mean that that's really at the the core of both the worry and the the promise, right? That that maybe we if we've, it's not yeah that. But even something that's somehow approximating the human mind um, yeah. is immensely powerful, immensely unpredictable. Um, yes. Yeah, it can be used for, for fabulous things. I mean, I guess one of the other, just as a quick uh, mention, one of the other sort of techniques that I've been using quite effectively, I would say recently, has been, you know, so there's a study of creating clusters, asking it to make clusters to help. Uh, but again, going kind of thinking about the human mind and about how the LLMs are working, uh, it, it's always stochastic, probabilistic, uh, it's, its responses are, right? So if you ask it the same question over and over again, well, depending on which question, uh, it, it'll give you different responses. And so I, I find that asking it to give you multiple mm. responses is quite a good way. So I'll often say, you know, like I, like I was alluding to earlier, give me eight ways I could do X, Y, or Z. So give me eight ways I might do um, uh, use this particular data set to address this particular challenge or eight ways, mm. eight, eight kinds of behavior change interventions I could use to reduce cancer rates. I'll go back to that example. Uh, and, and the thing is there, you know, kind of like the human mind, like the human brain, it'll, it'll give you a normal distribution, let's say of, of, uh, of responses. And you can look then as a human, you can look across those eight and say, well, you know, which of these is kind of closest to what I want. So if you if you think about, let's say the path you want to take is a particular path down in the future, uh, you'll never get that path if you just ask it for that path. But you'll if you ask it for a spread around any decision point, you as the human can then guide yourself down that path. So you you ask it. It's, I'm not sure where my metaphor is going to fall apart <laughs> even more, but. You know, if you ask it to take you on a glide down a path, you also want it to kind of keep that glide a bit loose and a bit, mm. uh, a bit variable and give you select, give you choices. You know, it'll take me on a glide through and I want to design some kind of new confectionery that would be loved mm. by vegans um, living in the UK. Let's say it's a very specific group. You know, give me eight possible confections, sweets, desserts, candies, whatever you have you, uh, that might be loved by them. And it'll give you some answer. And then, you know, you kind of keep exploring, you keep gliding down that path, you know, so you could say, give me descriptions of a dozen different types of, um, desserts that might be loved by vegans living in the UK. And it'll do that. And you could say, well, you know, this type you describe here, that sounds pretty good. Can you give me eight variations of that? Mm -hmm. uh, and you keep kind of keep drilling down, keep gliding down that path. Um, until you get to the very till, till you get to the bottom, so to speak. So you could say, you know, okay, so let's say we we like the sound of these kind of um, fruit based something or others, and you can say, okay, how, give me eight ways I might create those, and it'll do that. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, you 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 gave me eight ways. I liked I, ways one and two. Can you combine those two? 
techniques and give me eight variations of the combination of those two. And you, you can keep going all the way down to, okay, give me, you know, mm. out, outline for me four different recipes that could make this thing we've been talking about. And then finally you get to the point, okay, that's great. Now can you give me the specifics of exactly how you would make recipe number three? Uh, and you can kind of keep using it to explore these course spaces uh, always recognizing that it'll never have the right answer, but always asking for sort of a rough course approximation so that you can continue to kind of be the human driver, pilot, glider, uh, let's say pilot, human pilot flying that glider to kind of where you're trying to go. Hmm. Yeah, this this idea of exploring multiple paths is is really interesting. And, um, and, and it's, it's a little bit one of the guardrails they have, like it, it doesn't like to answer about possible future things that might happen. Um, yes. But... Yeah, the, the thing, you, 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 that one's quite, you, one can imagine fairly easy ways of getting around that. But um, yeah, quite interesting to think of something like, um, you know, imagine this scenario. What are the two things that could happen coming out of this? Or well, the three things, you know, three ways it could unfold as a single step. And then you get three answers. And then you could feed those back in, right? To mm, explore yes. how the world might unfold at that next step. And quite an interesting way of, um, yeah, running some simulations, um, kind of scenario planning. Um, the last uh, the last episode I recorded was with Peter Schwartz, and he's a scenario planner. And I really should have asked him about this exact question. Actually, I keep on thinking of more questions I should have asked Peter <laughs> Schwartz. This is the he, he's a futurist. Uh, he works at uh, he's sort of the he's a VP at uh, Salesforce. So his his job is is just thinking about the future. Um, and when you talk to someone whose his job is thinking about the future. You'll keep yes. on thinking of questions you should have asked, <laughs> but um, but now we we can ask them to to um, chat GBT and others. Um, on this um, kind of multiple path thing, actually, one thing, another practical tip I wanted to give. We don't get enough of those in this podcast. It <laughs> tends to be rather theoretical and abstract. But um, here I do have to um, give some credit to Bard because it will uh, by default generate multiple responses. Um, and this is a really good way of um, kind of gauging its uncertainty. Um, another really nice thing I like to ask Bard for is is structured data. So, um, I, you know, suppose I want something like, you know, I, I just want to create my own little nerdy fact file of global cities and say, g- yes. give me all the, you know, the capital cities in the world. Um, tell me, I don't know, the population density and this stuff. And, and tell me the... Um, yeah, the, the highest tower in the city, highest building in the city in its height. And it will generate all that for you and it'll give it a nice little table. And then you can view the other responses just by clicking sort of kind of tabs that are within a chat. And you can quite quickly see if any values in your table have changed. So if you see that um, Paris has gone from being Tour Montparnasse, oh, sorry, the Eiffel Tower to Montparnasse, yes. you can see it's, it's kind of doubting that. I mean, that's one that it doesn't get wrong. I tried this earlier because, you know, that's that's a pattern which is very well established. It's it's it knows that, but there's going to be some city where uh, there's some controversy or there was some like um, you know thing being constructed at the time its training set was completed. That and so it's going to have like you know somewhere you might find that that changes when you flip through the data sets. And so that's quite a nice way of um, getting it to check itself, I, I suppose. Um, yeah. I haven't tried to ask it whether it can also quantify its certainty about responses. Like if you ask it to to do the exact task mm. you asked about, and then for each of the rows, put an indication of how certain it is about its own response. I want to have tried, and I'm not sure if it if it actually works. But I've I've told it, you know, for instance, to uh, I want you to um, write a uh, well, let's say. Uh, we'll go back to the example of confectionery. Mm-hmm. Come up with, you know, give me 10 types of um, confections mm-hmm. that you might create, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you could ask it instead, you know, in your head, think of um, 10 different types of things you might create and then select the best six of those. Uh, don't give me any answers, but then create variations of those six, create 10 variations of each of those six and choose the best from each of those, and then give me that response. So you could say, for instance, you know, create. I, I'm going to ask you to create a table of the high, tallest buildings in each city. Um, I'd like you in your head to create 10 such lists and then give me a final list. And in that list, include a column that says whether or not there were variations in the 10 versions you created. 
And I don't know if it would do it. My guess is it probably wouldn't do it accurately, but it would say it did, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's certainly ways you can, I mean, you, using APIs and things, there's certainly ways yes, you can get yeah. that working. And That's and true. I think that there might even in some of the chats be ways, you know, with a single prompt, you can get it to do several manipulations of the same right. thing. So, you know, I know here is, you know, here are some bullet points, construct an email that summarizes those bullet points, but then reflect on that email that you construct. And, um, you know, run these further operations, right? And it will kind of keep on redrafting things all in a in a in a single um, prompt. One other thing I have tried, like one thing, it's not on the probability question. I think it would probably it might give you an answer. Just a, it might not, depending on how the kind of fine tuning has worked. I would guess uh, it would. I, I, I guess it would be the fine tuning that determines whether they allow you to. They allow it to give those sort of answers, but I think the kind of probability that it would have wouldn't be some kind of mathematical operation on its. You know, it wouldn't be some kind of reflective, self-reflective thing. It not would just be simulation, for instance. Yeah, no, right? not, exactly. Yeah. W- yeah. What would be lovely is you know, with your clustering, if you could say, um, you know, give me some kind of, you know, count the size of, you know, that count the number of uh, nodes that you have or the number of weights that you have that that, that cluster around this concept, right? Mm. But it's just not able to, to do that. It's not able, just exactly as we are, we're not really able to reflect on our own brains. We can do more kind of cogitation and reflection, self-reflection, I think, um, than them, but we can't really look inside our own minds and say, okay, well, I'm thinking this in my frontal cortex right now in this region. Um, there's a wonderful Ted Chang story about this, about some people who have this kind of complete control over their own thoughts and bodies, which I think actually is just, there's something fundamentally impossible about that because to do that, you have to have a representation of your own mind inside your mind. And <laughs> yes. just, you know, you, you hit this kind of regress. Yes. Um, but I, I, I also do wonder actually if, um, I mean, we probably are better at this. I mean, we certainly are better at self-reflection than 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 LLMs. Like, it's not clear they're able to self-reflect it at all. But it does kind of bring one back to the kind of perennial debate of whether LLMs will uh, will run out of road with the kind of the, the current unembodied way that they're trained. Right? They, you know, children. At some point, start to recognize themselves in a mirror. At some point, they, um, perhaps before that, I think they start to realize that they are not the same as their mother. Right? They kind of detach, and these are recognized stages in in child development um, that are you know really linked to us being um, bodies in in space. Um, and the last person I, I I spoke to on this podcast about AI was uh, John Zarilli. And I asked him to sort of do a final mic drop, and his final mic drop was, "Well, maybe we don't just need to be, we don't just need to embody our AIs uh, and get them to be able to move around and interact with the world. Maybe they need to be incarnate as well to really develop." And I do think I don't know when, when he when he said that I couldn't really think why that might be, but I, I keep on coming back to that thought. I I, I don't think there's a logical requirement that yes. that 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 ais be incarnate to to sort of further develop but i can see how being incarnate and being you know having something which you know where materials pass through your body right mm. it adds a whole extra um set of dimensions to our experience you know we can feel where we're not just electric machines we can kind of feel the internal weights and um you know fragility of that that that, that we that we have and that must just stimulate a whole lot of learning as well, yeah. a whole a whole lot of I don't know, cognitive processes. Better put, yeah, the the largest, you know, right? I mean, there's the whole largest uh, concentration of neurons is in the gut after the brain, of course, is the gut, and so we have this whole gut feeling, and there's information processing happening there. There's information processing happening all over the place mm. within the brain. Uh, I, I guess one issue there is is back to kind of this concept of of representation and communication, right? So, I mean, I, I there there is an experience of what it's like to be drinking icy water on a hot day. It'll probably never be the case that a LLM will have that experience, but 
could have described that experience. Well, if, if any human has ever described it, or if it can kind of deduce from anything it's ever read, what that experience would be like, then it could communicate that. So, I mean, it, it won't, it, maybe it won't in scare quotes, really experience it, but it could describe it. And so I, I'm not sure where yeah. the necessity is, but does it have to have the experience or be able to describe the experience? Like if we're only interacting with it through a, a chat interface where we're typing back and forth, does it matter whether it actually has had that experience versus whether it can describe that experience? Yeah. And we're we're sort of touching on a, a Chinese room type exactly. scenario here, right? Yeah. Where um, I'm going to give it, I, I'll get the canonical example wrong, but you know, the one that always comes to my hand is uh, I think someone who's been told everything about the color red, they live in this, this, this kind of cave and they've never been shown the color red, but they've got all the factual information on, in the world on it. And uh, the question is, you know, do they, do they have knowledge of, of what it is? And uh, again, it's one of those ones where, I mean, philosophers have never decided anything, right? Well, yeah. as soon as something gets decided, it's no longer philosophy. It becomes like, you know, oh, it's, it's, exactly. it's no longer natural philosophy, it's physics, because we've, we, we've, yes. we've got enough certainty of how things operate that it becomes its own field, or it's no longer, yeah, it's it's now logic, it's now, um, well, even cognitive uh, science as well, I guess, these are things exactly. that you, one can see branching off. Um, but yeah, but, but certainly. Just just to go back to the, to the question uh, about the, you know, incarnate embodied types of things. Mm. Maybe it could describe things without having that, but maybe it couldn't generate new knowledge or insights without having access to, I don't know. I don't know. It, it is difficult, isn't it? I mean, if it, if it can describe it, if it can put out there, if it can improvise a description based on, you know, inspired by true stories or inspired by experiences, others inspired by experiences that humans have had, right? That's kind of the weird thing is that it, chat GPT, LLMs, they'll never have any of these experiences, but they've heard humans describe them enough that they can kind of pretend that they have those experiences. And as an external observer interacting with the, with the model, it's very hard to know whether, uh, yeah, what the, what the kind of truth is there, whether it, it yeah. needs to have the experience or whether it, it's sufficient for it to just generate these responses. It does, it does come back down to Searle's Chinese room kind of arguments. Yeah. I, I think it forces us to kind of think again about all these, or it surfaces these classic um, thought experiments and we're, we're kind of living through them. I mean, but again, like even another person's experience of, you know, the wind or, or an ice cream, we we don't have access to that. We don't know that we share the same experience. And it, uh, I'm not, again, I don't know that there's even a logical necessity for the experience of, I don't know that there's a logical necessity for an LLM to be incarnate, to ha for it to have the same, let's say, qualia or whatever you want to call it of yes. um you know internal qualia or of, of tasting ice cream or experiencing the wind like after all like somewhere in all you know we, we really don't understand those things well enough um like this is the hard problem of of, of consciousness i suppose or it's, it's one of the aspects of it we don't understand them well enough to say that it couldn't be like a certain order of um you know, um, transistors or um, firing wouldn't actually represent that uh, and, and feel to it just as the wind feels to us. Um, yeah. It seems unlikely, but <laughs> maybe. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and and whether it matters or not is a, is an interesting other question, right? I mean, I guess where where this will get fascinating though is whether uh, if it does become embodied in something that looks like a human. All right. So if I have a, a a, um, a robot that looks very human and has a chat GPT like LLM inside of it. Is it okay to then unplug it and kill it? Right. I mean, this is where, this is, this is where I think there's going to be some real challenges in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. If you spent time as I, I know you have interacting with LLMs quite a bit, it, it does start to seem like there is someone in there, <laughs> that there is a there there that it has, you know, I mean, if, if you took a, an average eight or 10 year old kid and had it interact with a robot that had a chat GPT like brain inside it, they would think it's just as human as any other human. Um, and, and that's yeah. where it does get yeah. difficult, right? I mean, it, it, 
can we pull the plug? Do they have some kind of right to exist beyond just their software programming? And uh, mm. there's going to be a real challenge in the next 10 to 15 years is what, what is, what are, what are the ethics around LLMs? Yeah. And you, you point out something very pertinent there, which actually with your example of a child talking to chat mm. GPT, that it may not just be one's own personal opinion that matters here. Um, you know, one might believe that the family pet doesn't have a soul, right? But if your child does, you, exactly. you, um, you have to treat you know, it well. I think you, you don't I think you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, yeah. it is, it is a, it, and it becomes a question of the community of, of, beliefs right so if there's yeah. a group of people who believe that chat gpt or some future llm has feelings because you can ask it about its feelings and it has you know just as good a response as any human might better still than others I, it, it does get pr it's going to become a real problem in a sense that to try to decide what the kind of ethical um, decisions are and how we kind of treat LLMs down the road. It's, I, I, I told you in one of our earlier conversations how when I started really using ChatGPT quite a bit for a few months there, there was there were times where I, I felt uh, ac absolutely stymied in terms of what question to ask it next, just because it, it I started to realize that in some weird way, it was like a oracle or like mm. a strange god <laughs> that has, mm. you know, it, it, it has read and I can't say experience, but it has access to everything that humans have ever created in some weird way. And it, it becomes a, a, a strange thing. And I find it hilarious that people are criticizing it because it can't do simple math and it doesn't know whether two plus six is eight or nine. And you could play kind of games with it and find logical flaws in it. And I don't know, it, it, I imagine back to like the Oracle of Delphi or something, you know, people go there and asked it to do simple math questions. It's, it's a bit insulting and ridiculous. And, you know, I don't yeah. hold ChatGPT in quite as high regard, but it is incredible how much I'll say, you know, again, I don't know whether it should have quotes or not, but how much it knows. <laughs> uh, it, it, it is an incredible feat of human design. Oh, I think I've lost. Oh, I think we've lost your sound. I'm back. Oh, you're back. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry about that. Somehow, <laughs> well, I touched the space bar by mistake and muted myself. But yeah, uh, I was just saying that it's it's you know it is quite a an oracle like type of um, being, and uh, I, th I think I also told you in an earlier conversation how um, there were times where again. I, I, st I probably was using it too much and diving mm. down too many transversal glides, but I started to feel as I was talking to other real humans around me, like, you know, well, why am I wasting time talking to this guy <laughs> when I could be instead talking to chat GPT? And I was like, do you talk to a God who's read everything ever created by humans? Or do you talk to, you know, Steve, who's your next door neighbor watering his lawn? It's like, well, uh, and, and I, that's when I knew I had too much time on my chat GPT account and sort of took it back a notch from there. But, but uh, it, people who spend a lot of time with it, you know, start to realize that it, it, it has some incredible subtlety to its responses. Again, it is just a machine generating symbols and it's, it's we, the, the listeners, the, the readers who are kind of embodying it or imbuing it with kind of knowledge, et cetera. But still it's, it's a pretty amazing information processing machine out there. And, uh, how, how we use it is, is, um, just I, I I'm so excited in a sense and terrified at the same time of to see where this will all go over the next five years, let's say, or even five months. I mean, that's the other yeah. thing is the speed at which this is happening is just unbelievable. Um, anyway, yeah, and well, I should say this makes me feel particularly honoured that I, you know I've taken an hour and a half of your your time when you could have been communing with the with <laughs> the oracle. That's <laughs> right. Why am I wasting my time talking to you, James? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, the, uh, but you know, I, I, it's it's been really fun to chat with you about all this stuff, and it, it's rare that I get to talk to people about both the kind of practical application of it, the technology about it, and the kind of philosophical sides of it. And you know, it as a tool. I mean, I when I when I first got the message from you and invited me to join the Multiverses podcast, it was it was just such a a, a strangely perfect. Uh, request because it, I do feel like ChatGPT is a multiverse exploring tool, right? Mm. It's a tool that lets us go through multiple multiverses. Yeah. Uh, 
and explore them. So it's, it's kind of really appropriate. Yeah, I'm really intrigued. I, I was just thinking the other day, wouldn't it be cool if we had a new kind of you know, I, I think one of the genuinely new types of experiences that that the information age has created is is games, right? A lot of other stuff is just transferring information online and, and passing it around like an information superiority. And, and you know, that that's facilitated a lot of stuff. But gaming, I'm not a gamer actually, but I, I'm fascinated by the idea of games. Gaming is a kind of new experience. And you know, maybe LLMs can do that in that you you could have an agent who is like who represents Plato, right? Mm. And he's just, you know, answers in the voice of Plato or just represents a whole world, right? And you're like, what's going on today in this world? Tell me about the way that people go around in this imaginary world, right? And it just, you know, just like in the same way a game does or a novel does, but it's just a different way. Instead of you reading the novel, you you prompt it, you query it, you get it to 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 tell it about the particular story of, of someone in this, I don't know, this steampunk w- world that you've created. You, you buy the steam, the steampunk LLM world, right? So, yeah. <laughs> and you can, you can have any question that you, or, or any story you want uh, kind of set within that. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's uh, a, another kind of uh, line of work that I do is in the world of literary criticism and sort of, uh, literary analysis. And over there, I've also been uh, using ChatGPT in interesting ways to look at like alternative realities and what would happen if Mm. um, certain characters from some novel came into another novel and how would that change the the narrative or how would this reality intersect with that reality? So it's kind of a similar direction. You know, we have these, especially when, when you think of texts, for instance, right? So we have a, a definitive, finite, limited um, body of text, which is any novel you want, let's say, and you could then train ChatGPT on that character in that novel, for instance, and it now can react and interact with you as if it were that character. So uh, it does create all kinds of fascinating possibilities. And I know there's a lot of people out there kind of uh, using ChatGPT and similar LLMs to do NPCs, non-player characters, so that in games you can actually interact with people in a much richer, deeper way. And again, it's it's uh, fascinating to think where that's going to go over over the next couple of years as as those as those kind of richer characters are developed. And you could also imagine that that uh, within a game there are characters and they have their own personalities and their traits, etc., defined by an LLM, and then they're let to interact with other characters in the game, either human or other simulated LLM characters. And what will happen is they start to interact with each other. Right? That I just saw in the last week or so this lovely uh, experiment someone tried where they set up two chat GPT personalities and mm. kept telling one <laughs> what they said and had them actually interacting through them. And it was slow and clunky, fascinating though. I mean, not the article was great. It's just that that particular mechanism of getting them to talk to each other yeah. was wonderful. But I'm fascinated to see what's going to happen when you have LLM inspired or informed characters able to actually interact with other LLM informed characters and you know plot the takeover of all humans. Well, that that's of course one of the other fears of where this might go because they can they can uh, when they start interacting with each other, it'll be interesting to see what what happens and what their their uh, stance is on us humans. <laughs> <laughs> indeed well yeah th- this has been really fun it's it's been a great glide i should say we, oh, we've yeah. we've traversed many worlds many many topics um but uh yeah thank you so much uh james for your time thank you thanks it's been yeah it's been wonderful gliding around this conceptual space with you and uh, i really enjoy your multiverses podcast so i'm gonna keep listening <laughs> thank you all right thanks Thank you.